What is up guys, welcome to Barton, my name is Heinrich, and today we're finally finishing off our first enemy. So we currently have him patrolling around like this, idling when he reaches an edge or a wall, and if he sees us, he will detect us, and then he will charge at us and try to attack us. So the only thing we have left to do is make it so that we can actually fight back. So let's go ahead and take another look at our state diagram. So we already have all of this implemented. Now we just need to take care of this left portion of it. So we have our stun state and our dead state still left to go. But before we take a look at those two states, let's take a look at our damage function. Seeing as all of our enemies should be able to take damage, logically we should put our damage function in our entity class. So let's head to our scripts folder, enemies, state machine, and then open up our entity script. So let's just come above our flip function and let's create our damage function. So we will have a public virtual void, called damage. And our damage function is going to have an input parameter of type attack details, and we'll just call it attack details, like that. So let's think about what our damage function needs to do. Firstly, it needs to damage our enemy. So we need to give our enemy health, and then we need to decrease that health. So let's open up our d underscore entity class, and let's give the enemy some health. So at the top, I'm just going to declare a public float called max health. And by default, we'll just set it equal to 30, like that. Then back in our entity class, we can come up to our variables and let's declare a private float that we'll call current health. Like that. Then we can come to our start function and set current health to our max health when the game starts. So current health equals entity data dot max health. Next we can come back to our damage function and then decrease our health. So we'll say current health minus equals attack details dot damage amount. Like that. So the way we were doing the enemy last time, we had a knockback state. So when we hit the enemy, it would get knocked back. But seeing as I want to implement a stun mechanic in the game as well, we want to give our enemy time to actually attack our player unless the player stuns him first. So when the enemy gets hit, we don't necessarily want it to interrupt whatever it's busy doing. So instead of knocking back the enemy, we're going to make it so that when we damage the enemy, he just hops up a little bit just to show that we're damaging him and then only when we stun him will we have a knockback. So let's just go ahead and declare an integer that we can store the direction that the knockback should be when we do choose to implement it. So let's come back up to our variables and let's declare a private int that will call last damage direction, like that. Then back in our damage function, we can set this by saying if, attack details dot position dot x is greater than a live game object dot transform dot position dot x then that means that our last damage direction equals negative one because whatever did damage to the enemy has a greater x position than the enemy meaning it came from the right else we can set last damage direction equal to one like that. Okay, now let's make the enemy hop when we damage it. So let's just write another function that's going to be a public virtual void, and we'll call it damage hop, like that. The function is going to have an input parameter that is a float velocity, and this is just going to be the velocity in the y direction that we set for the enemy when we damage him. Then inside the function, we can say velocity workspace, which remember is our little piece of scrap vector two paper, and we can dot set. And for the X, we're just going to say rigid body dot velocity dot X. And for the Y, we'll say velocity like that. Then we just need to set this velocity. So rigid body dot velocity equals velocity workspace. Now let's go back to our d underscore entity class and let's declare a hop velocity. So we'll declare another public float and we'll just call it damage hop speed 
And by default, let's set it to something like three. And then back in our entity class, in our damage function, we can call our damage hop function after we decrease our health. So damage hop, and then we'll just pass it entity data dot damage hop speed. Okay, so if we save this and go back to Unity, we can try it out. And I'm hoping three is enough. Doesn't seem like anything happens when we hit him, but let's go to our entity data and let's set the damage hop speed to, let's say 10. We can exaggerate it a little bit just to make sure it works. Okay, so 10 seems to be quite tame still. So I think I like it this way, but we can set it higher if you want. Perfect, so our damage function is working and we can damage our enemy, but nothing really happens to him yet. So let's go ahead and make our stun state, and then we can see how we can implement that. So let's come back to our states folder, and then let's create a new c -sharp script that we'll call stun state, and then we can come to our data folder and then create a new c -sharp script. This time it's d underscore stun state, like that. And then we can just go ahead and open both of these up. Cool. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. We wanted to take different amounts of hits to stun different enemies, and maybe even plan for the future, and say maybe we're gonna add different weapons and things to the game, and maybe the different weapons will make it take different amounts of hits to stun these enemies. Okay, so let's start with our stun state, and then we can just get rid of this code and make it inherit from state. Then let's go ahead and generate the constructor. And let's add the state data. So we have a protected D underscore stun state called state data. In the constructor, we say D underscore stun state called state data. And then we say this dot state data equals, you guessed it, state data. And then we can go ahead and generate the overrides as well. We don't want the first three, just like that. Now basically what our stun state is going to do is just make the enemy immobile for a certain amount of time, and then it'll just go back to whatever state it needs to be in afterwards. So let's go to our D underscore stun state and get rid of this code, make it inherit from scriptable object. And let's start off by declaring our stun time. So we'll have a public float called stun time. And by default, let's just set it to three seconds. I also mentioned that when we stun the enemy, we want to have a knockback. So let's declare a, another public float. And this time it's going to be our stun knockback time. And by default, we'll set it equal to 0 0.2. Next, we want to have the angle of our knockback. So this is going to be a public vector two called stun knockback angle. And then next, we also want to have our knockback speed. So let's declare another float called stun knockback speed. And by default, let's just set it to 20. Now, before we forget, let's put our create acid menu code up top. So let's just go here and copy this. And we'll change it to new stun state. Change the stun over there. Perfect. Okay, now we have all the data we need for the stun state. So let's go back to the stun state. And the first thing we wanna do is keep track of if our stun time is over or not. So let's create a Boolean, which is going to be protected bool, and we'll just call it is stun time over. And let's immediately come to enter and set that to false. So is stun time over equals false. And then, and then we can come to our logic update function and keep track of the time. So we'll say if time.time, .time, 
is greater than or equal to our start time plus our state data dot stun time. If this is the case, then is stun time over equals true. And of course, this is the Boolean that we're going to use in our enemy specific stun state to change to a different state. Next, we want to knock back the enemy. So let's come back to our entity class and write a knockback function. So let's come up to the functions where we set the velocity. And let's create another public virtual void. And instead of creating a knockback function specifically, I'm just going to create another set velocity function that this time takes in an angle, a speed and a direction in order to set the velocity, just to generalize it a little bit so we can use it for more than just knockback. For example, we'll use it for the dodge of our archer enemy. So let's just call it set velocity. And this is kind of cool, just in case you didn't know about this, seeing as these two functions have the same name, the code will automatically know which one to use based on which input parameters we give it. So for this one, let's have our float velocity. And next we're going to have our vector two angle. And then finally, we're going to have our int direction. Just like that. Now the first thing we're going to do in this function is normalize the angle. So we'll say angle dot normalize like that. We do this so that we don't have to worry about normalizing our angle before we send it through to this function. So we can just leave our vector twos as they are everywhere where we use it. And we'll just normalize it before we use it. Next, we can create our velocity. So let's come and say velocity workspace dot set. And for the x component, we're going to use angle dot x multiplied with our velocity multiplied with our direction. And then for the y component, we're going to use angle dot y multiplied with our velocity. And then finally, we just need to set this velocity. So rb dot velocity equals velocity workspace. So now back in our stun state class, in our enter function, we can set the knockback velocity. So after we set is stun time over to false, we'll come and we'll say entity dot set velocity. And as you can see here, we now have two functions that we can use. We can use the up and down arrow keys to check the two different ones out. So we want this one. For our velocity, we're going to use state data dot stun knockback speed. Then for our angle, we're going to use state data dot stun knockback angle. And finally, for the direction, we want to use that last damage direction we set up earlier. But I forgot to make it a public variable. So let's come back to entity, go find our last damage direction. And let's just change it to public. And then we just want to come up and make it so that it is public get but private set. So it can only be set from this class. And let's just move it up with the rest of these variables. Cool. So back in our stun state, we can say entity dot last damage direction. So now we have a little issue. We don't have any friction in our game and nothing to stop the enemy from just sliding along the ground after we set its knockback velocity. So we want to detect when it hits the ground and then set its velocity to zero. So in order to do this, we're going to have to implement a ground check for the enemy. So let's come back to our entity class. And let's start off by declaring a ground check transform. So we'll have a serialized field, private transform called ground check. Then we just need to come to our D underscore entity class and set our ground check radius as we're going to use an overlap circle for this. So we'll just come and declare another public float called ground check radius. And by default, let's just set it equal to 0 0.3. We already have a what is ground layer mask. So we're good there. So let's come back to our entity class. And let's go down to our check functions. And let's just create a public virtual bool 
called check ground. And then inside the function, we just have to say return physics 2D dot overlap circle. And the position we're using is our ground check dot position. Our radius is going to be our entity data dot ground check radius. And then finally, our layer mask is going to be entity data dot what is ground. So let's come back to our stun state and let's declare a is grounded variable. So we'll have protected bool is grounded. And then we'll just come to our do checks function and set that variable. So is grounded equals entity dot check ground. So next let's come to our logic update function. And let's say if is grounded is true and our time dot time is greater than or equal to start time plus state data dot stun knockback time. And the reason we have this little time here is because as soon as we knock back the enemy is grounded is going to be true because the enemy is on the ground. And so once the logic update function gets called, it'll set the velocity to zero. So by giving it a little like buffer time over here, it gives the enemy time to get into the air where is grounded is no longer true. So if both these conditions are met, then we'll set the velocity to zero. So entity dot set velocity. And this time we're using the first set velocity function and we'll just set it to zero. Now the only little issue here is while the enemy is stunned, we still wanna be able to hit the enemy, meaning we still want the enemy to bounce. But currently, as soon as our knockback time is over, we're continuously going to set the velocity to zero. So let's create a Boolean just to keep track of this. So let's come up and create a protected bool and we'll just call it is movement stopped. Like that. We just need to remember to come into our enter function and set that to false. So is movement stopped equals false. We'll come to our if statement and we'll say and not is movement stopped. So we have not yet set the velocity to zero. And then in this case, we'll say is movement stopped equals true. So we will only ever come into this if statement once. Okay, so now let's take a look at how we're actually going to stun the enemy. So let's come back to our D underscore entity class. And we're going to declare two more variables. One is going to be our enemy's stun resistance. And two is going to be our enemy's stun recovery time. So our stun resistance is how much stun damage needs to be done before the enemy gets stunned. And the stun recovery time is how long since the last time the enemy has been damaged, do we need to wait before we can reset how many times the enemy has to get hit before he gets stunned. So let's just come and declare two more public floats. And the first one is going to be our stun resistance. And by default, I'm just going to set it to three and Next we have our public float stun recovery time. And by default, I'm just gonna set this to two. So if we don't damage the enemy for two seconds, our stun resistance is going to get reset to three. Let's come back to our entity class and let's come up to our health variable. And underneath it, let's just declare another private float. And this time we have our current stun resistance. And then next, we also want to have a private float called last damage time. Then let's just come to our start function and let's set our current stun resistance equal to entity data dot stun resistance. Then let's come back to our damage function. And in here, we'll start off by setting our last damage time equal to time dot time. So when we damage the enemy, we keep track of exactly what time the enemy got damaged. And now after we decrease the enemy's health, we wanna decrease the stun resistance. So that means we need to go to our attack details and add a stun damage amount. So let's open up our attack details script again. And let's just add another public float called stun damage amount, like that. 
And this is why it's so much better for us to use this struct instead of the way we were doing it before, because we just add it here and now all of our enemies should have it and know what it is. And we didn't have to go to a thousand different places making that change. So back in entity, we can, after we decrease the health, say current stun resistance minus equals attack details dot stun damage amount. Perfect. So now we wanna make it so that when our stun resistance drops below zero, the enemy is stunned. But we are currently in our entity class, so we're just gonna have another Boolean that keeps track of when we are stunned, and then we'll transition to our stun state in our enemy one class. So let's come up to the top, and we're gonna declare a protected bool. So we'll do it beneath the private. So protected bool, and we'll just call it is stunned. Then back in our damage function, we'll say if current stun resistance is less than or equal to zero, then is stunned is true. So finally, we just need to make it so that if enough time has passed, our stun resistance gets reset. So let's come above our damage function and let's write a public virtual void function called reset stun resistance. And it's not going to take in any parameters. And inside the function, all we're gonna say is is stunned equals false and current stun resistance equals entity data dot stun resistance, like that. Now we just need to come to our update function and in here we'll say if time dot time is greater than or equal to last damage time plus our entity data dot stun recovery time, then we're going to call our reset stun resistance function like that. So all of our enemies will automatically do this. Okay, so let's go back to Unity and let's create our enemy specific stun state. That way we can transition to it. So we'll come to our enemy specific folder, enemy one, and then we'll create a new C sharp script called E1 underscore stun state. We can just go ahead and open that up and let's do what we usually do and get rid of this code and then make it inherit from stun state. We can then go ahead and generate the constructor and then get a reference to our enemy. So we have private enemy one called enemy and then add it to the constructor. So enemy one enemy this dot enemy equals enemy. Then we can come and generate the overrides. We don't want the first three. Click OK, perfect. So now in our enemy one specific stun state, we're going to put in the transitions to the different states. So what I'm thinking of doing is when we come out of our stun state, if our player is close enough, it'll immediately attack the player. Otherwise, if it sees the player, it'll go into the charge state because it's angry. And then finally, if it cannot see the player, it'll go into the look for player state. And in this case, we're gonna make it turn immediately. So we actually need to come back to our stun state and make it look for the player. So we'll come up and declare two more protected bools. The first one is perform close range action. And our next protected bool is is player in min aggro range. And then we just need to add both of these to our do checks. So perform close range action equals entity dot check player in close range action. And then next you need to set is player in min aggro range equal to entity dot check player in min aggro range. Just like that. Okay, cool. So now in our E1 stun state, we can use those two variables. So let's come to our logic update function. And we'll just say if is stun time over, then we'll say if perform close range action, then state machine dot change state to our enemy dot 
melee attack state. Like that. Else if our player is in the min aggro range, so is player in min aggro range, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot charge state. And then finally else, meaning our enemy is not close enough to get attacked or is not seen, then we'll say enemy dot look for player state dot set turn immediately to true. And then we're going to change to that state. So state machine dot change state to enemy dot look for player state. Just like that. Now actually I forgot in our stun state in our exit function, we need to come and say entity dot reset stun resistance so that that gets reset when the enemy wakes back up. Cool. Now we just need to come to our enemy one class and let's create our stun state. So public e1 underscore stun state and we'll just call it stun state. Create the public getter and the private setter. And then let's get the state data. So serialize field private d underscore stun state. And again, just stun state data. And now let's call the constructor. So we'll say stun state equals a new e1 underscore stun state. And for our entity, we pass this. For our finite state machine, we pass our state machine. Our animation Boolean name is just going to be stun. Our state data is stun state data. And then finally, our enemy one is this again. Perfect. So that means now in our enemy one class, we can override our damage function. So let's just come up to the name, generate override. We can deselect all and just select our damage function. Click OK. It added it down here for us. And now in the damage function, we can just say if is stunned, then state machine dot change state to our stun state. Just like that. Now we just need to add another parameter to our if statement. And that is just to make sure that we don't go to our stun state over and over again while we're already in our stun state. So we'll just come and say and state machine dot current state does not equal stun state. Like that. Cool. So let's head back to unity. And then let's click on our enemy one. And so we need to add our ground check transform. So let's come to our alive game object and create a new empty child. We'll call it ground check. And let's just drag that in. And let's also just position that a little bit better. So ground check, let's just move this down here. Just like that. And let's click back on enemy one. So next we need our stun state data. So let's go to our data folder inside of our enemy one folder, create a new state data for our stun state, call it E1 underscore stun state data. And we need to set the stun knockback angle. And we'll just use one in the X and two in the Y. And let's click on enemy one, drag this in. And then next we need to set up our animation. So let's just pull up our animator back here, pull up our animation window. And let's click on the alive game object and then create a new animation clip. Let's go to our animations folder. And we'll call this enemy one underscore stun. Next, let's navigate to our sprites folder enemies enemy one. Now I think the last four. Yes. So from sprite 18 to 21 is our stun animation. Let's just drag that in. See what it looks like. 60 is way too fast. Of course. Let's check 15. Even that's a bit fast. I'm going to change it to like eight. I like that. Perfect. So we can close our animation window and come to our animator. 
here we have our stun state. So we can go to our stun state from any state. So let's make a transition from any state to our stun state. Click on it, make sure has exit time is not ticked, and then change the transition duration to zero. Oh, we need to add our stun boolean parameter. So stun, okay. And then back on our transition, let's add the one condition this time. And this time it's stun equals true. And now we need to make transitions from our stun state to all our different states that we can go to after the stun. So let's take another look at what that was. So we can either transition to our melee attack state, charge state, or look for player state. So let's start with our look for player state. Click on the transition, make sure we don't have an exit time. Transition duration is zero. Add the two conditions. The first condition is stun is false. And the second condition is look for player is true. Then we have a transition to our charge state. Click on the transition, has exit time is false. Transition duration is zero. Add the two conditions, stun is false and charge is true. And then finally, we have a transition to our melee attack state. Click on the transition, has exit time is false. Transition duration is zero. Add the two conditions. The first condition is stun is false. And the second condition is melee attack is true. Okay, we should have everything we need now. So let's run this and see what happens. So if we hit our enemy, he's not getting stunned. And I think we forgot to set our stun damage. So let's go to our player combat controller and let's come to our check attack hitbox function. So here you can see we're sending through attack details. So we're gonna work on a, diff on a better combat system next time for different weapons and things, but for now let's just set our stun damage amount. So we're going to have a private float that is serialized. So serialized field, private, float stun damage amount and let's set it to one by default and then let's come down to our check attack hitbox function and we'll say attack details dot stun damage amount equals stun damage amount like that so let's go back to unity click on our player and just make sure our stun damage amount is there. So it's on our player combat controller. Stun damage amount is one. So that means we need to hit the enemy three times before he gets stunned. So one, two, three. Our enemy is stunned, but our animation is not playing. And that is because we should come back to our animator, click on our alive game object, and then the transition from any state to our stun state we need to come to our settings and untick can transition to self. So now if we run the game again and we hit the enemy three times, he gets stunned and then he chases after us because he sees us. So now if we stun him again and we're right in front of him, he should attack us. Perfect. And now let's stun him one last time and now he won't see us. And as you can see, he immediately starts looking for us. Perfect. Okay, next we need to work on actually killing the enemy. So let's just go ahead and go to our scripts folder and let's go to our states folder and let's create the dead state. So create a new C sharp script, call it dead state and then go to the data folder and let's create a new C sharp script. That's gonna be our D underscore dead state. And then let's just go ahead and go back to enemies, enemy specific, enemy one and let's create our e1 underscore dead state and now let's just go ahead and open them all up so we have our dead state then we have our dead state and then we have our dead state so we're not going to be doing much in dead state yet we're just setting it up for the future when we finally figure out how we wanna do spawning the enemies and taking care of like transitioning between levels and things like that. So for now in our D underscore dead state, we can get rid of this code. We can make it inherit from scriptable object and then we can go ahead and 
copy this create asset menu line, paste that in, call it new dead state, and dead state like that. And for now, this is all we're going to need here. Then in our dead state class, we can delete this code, make it inherit from state. Then we can generate the constructor. Then we need to get a reference to our data. So protected D underscore dead state called state data. Add it to the constructor. So D underscore dead state called state data. This dot state data equals state data. State data. Okay. And then we can generate the overrides. So generate overrides. We don't want the first three. Click OK. And there we have everything we need. So basically all that we're going to do in the dead state is for now deactivate the game object and spawn the, the particles. So let's go to our D underscore dead state and let's create a public game object that will call our death chunk particle. So death chunk particle like that. And then we'll also have our public game object death blood particle. Then back in our dead state, in our enter function, we can come and say game object dot instantiate. And we have to say game object dot this time because we're no longer inheriting from mono behavior. Then for our parameters, we're going to start off with state data dot death blood particle. Then we'll say entity dot alive game object dot transform dot position as our position. And then finally, as our rotation, we're going to say state data dot death blood particle dot transform dot rotation. Just like that. Then we can just go ahead and copy and paste this. And this time, instead of death blood particle, we'll be using our death chunk particle. So death chunk particle there and death chunk particle here. Just like that. And now instead of destroying the game object, we'll just set it inactive. So we'll come and say entity dot game object dot set active. And we're setting it to false. Cool. Now we just need to come to our E1 dead state. And then we can get rid of this code, make it inherit from dead state, generate the constructor, and then add our reference to enemy one. So private enemy one called enemy, add to the constructor. This dot enemy equals enemy. And now let's generate the overrides. So we don't want the first three. Okay. And that's it. We're not doing anything else in this class for now. Now, finally, we can come back to our enemy one class and create the state. So we're going to have a public E one underscore dead state called dead state. Then we can create the public getter and the private setter. And then next we need to get the reference to the data. So serialize field private D underscore dead state called dead state data. And now let's call the constructor in our start function. So dead state equals a new E one underscore dead state pass this as the entity state machine as the state machine dead as the animation boolean name, dead state data as the data, and then finally this as our enemy one. Now we just need to make it so that we actually die when we die. So let's come back and look at our entity class again. And we're basically going to do the same thing we did for the stun resistance. So in our damage function, we are decreasing our health. So once our health gets below zero, we will set is dead equal to true. 
So let's go back up to our variables and create our is dead boolean. So it's another protected bool called is dead. Then we can come back down to our damage function and we'll say if current health is less than or equal to zero, then is dead equals true. Now we probably also want all of our enemies to have some sort of particle when it gets hit like we had before. So we're gonna add that to the damage function now as well. So back in our D underscore entity class, let's create a variable for our particle. So after all our floats, let's say public game object, and we'll just call it hit particle like that. And then back in our entity damage function, whenever we take damage, we'll just instantiate this particle. So this time we can say instantiate directly because we're inheriting from mono behavior. So we're going to instantiate entity data dot hit particle and we're instantiating it on a live game object dot transform dot position and our rotation is going to be quaternion dot Euler and for this we'll have 0f for the x, 0f for the y and then for the z parameter we're going to have a random dot range between 0 and 360 degrees. Just like that. Now we want to go back to our enemy one class and in our damage function we're going to say if is dead then state machine dot change state to dead state. And actually seeing as in both of these if statements we are changing states we want to make this a series of else if statements. So let's move this second one to the beginning and then let's change the second if to an else if. Just like that. So let's try it out. Let's go back to Unity and let's navigate to our enemy specific folder, enemy one and then our data folder and let's create our dead state data and let's call it e1 underscore dead state data. We can then click on our enemy one game object and drag this in. We can then click on it and let's add our particles. So our particles are in our prefab folder and we have our death blood particle which goes in there and our death chunk particle which goes in there. And then back on enemy one we want to navigate to our entity data object and here we have a slot for our hit particle. So back in our prefabs folder enemy one hit particle. Whoops. Head back here. We can just lock the inspector so it doesn't change. Go back to prefabs and enemy one hit particle. Drag it in. Let's unlock our inspector and we should be good. We don't currently have an animation for death but seeing as we just disable the game object when the enemy dies it should be fine. So let's hit play and let's just hit it three times. Boom! The enemy dies like it should. So because it takes three hits to stun the enemy and three hits to kill the enemy we're never going to stun the enemy. So let's just go back to enemy one and entity data and let's just increase the max health to 50. Why not? Sounds good to me. Okay so we're basically almost done. What happens from here on out is up to you guys. You guys can mess around with the timings of things, mess around with the transitions and the way the, the character should react to certain things. Um, we might look at making it so that when the enemy's confronted with a ledge like this and he sees the player, he doesn't continuously uh, get aggroed like this. Because as you can see, he's just kind of glitching out, slowly moving forward and eventually he'll just fall off. So what we can do for instance, just to give you guys an example, is let's go to our player detected state. So as you can see in our player detected state, we're not detecting ledges at all. So let's just add that in. So we can just come up and say protected bool is detecting ledge. And then we can just throw that into our checks. So is detecting ledge equals entity dot check ledge 
like that. And then back in our E1 player detected state, we can just add another condition saying if a ledge is detected, flip the player and transition to the walk state. So we'll say else if is detecting ledge, then entity dot flip, and then state machine dot change state to enemy dot move state. So now when we run the game and the enemy comes to the ledge and detects us, he's just gonna ignore us, turn around and walk away. Nope. There might be some bugs involved though. Okay, and that's probably because we didn't make any changes to our animator. So if we come look at our animator, we are currently saying player detected to walk state. We don't have a transition like that. So we can come back in here and make a transition from our player detected state to our walk state. But this might get confusing quite quickly. And as you can see, our animator is getting quite messy already, even though we don't have that many states. So we're gonna do something real quick. Instead of setting up our animator to have transitions like we have with our states, instead we're gonna make a empty state and we're just gonna call it empty like that. Now, instead of having all these different transitions between our different states, all of our states are just going to have a transition going into empty and going from empty into our state with the condition for that state being either true or false. Empty isn't going to have an animation, but instead acts like a, a gateway. So say we're in our charge state and charge gets set to false, we'll go to enemy and then we'll just go to what other state we need to be in. So let's just go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna give one example and then we'll, you can just do the rest on your own. So let's start with our idle state. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete these transitions. And then we're gonna come and make a transition from idle to empty. And then we're gonna click on it, make sure has exit time is not ticked. Click on the settings drop down. make sure transition duration is zero. And then in the conditions list, we're just gonna add one. And this condition is that idle is false. We can then make a transition from empty back to idle, untick has exit time, set transition duration to zero. And in the conditions list, idle is true. So you basically just have to do that for every state. So let's do it for charge, get rid of all his transitions. And this is going to be a bit of work right now, but we'll just do it like this for the rest of the enemies from now on. So whenever we create a state, we just set up the two transitions to empty, and then whatever transitions we do in code will always work because the parameters take care of themselves and they can transition anywhere, but it's all controlled from our code. So we'll make a transition to empty, untick has exit time, transition duration is zero, and our condition is charge must be false. And then we make a transition from empty back to charge, untick has exit time, transition duration is zero, and our condition is charge must be true. Okay, you can just pause it here and do it for the rest of your states. I'm just gonna do it quickly, put a little time lapse on, and then we'll meet up afterwards. Cool, and so now we have all of our states set up in the animator again. As you can see, this looks a lot better than it was before, and it'll be quicker whenever we create a new state, we just have to add two transitions. We also still have our enemy one hurt state up here, which we're no longer using, so we can just go ahead and delete that. Let's just test the game and make sure we did everything correctly. So the enemy's still walking, he's still idling. Oh, ah, okay, so he sees us. When he turns, what is happening? Ah, I know what's happening. So 
in our code, we said when is detecting ledge, but we should be saying when is not detecting ledge. Run it now. So it'll still charge at us. Perfect. Let's get across this gap. They see me rolling. Why is he not going into his move state? I probably just messed up with a condition. She should have kept the game running so I could see what's happening in the animator. We're gonna drag it down here. Okay, so he's stuck in the empty state. Did I make a mistake with the walk state? I think I did, yes. So the transition into walk must be true. Everything should work now. So it's very important that you get all of your conditions correct. He's working wonderfully. Okay, so when we hit him, he flips. Now, why would that be? Okay, so as you can see now, when the enemy detects us and we hit him, he flips, which is not quite what we want. So, and that's happening because when we hit him and he bounces up, the ledge detection no longer detects the floor, so he thinks there's a ledge. So we can just fix that by coming to our entity data class and setting the ledge check to, let's say, one instead of 0 0.4. So that should no longer be an issue. Let's have him run at us, detect if we hit him. Yep, it still works. He will swipe at us. Perfect. So as you can see, we've given our enemies so much more behavior and like personality right now, and it's very exciting. So there's lots of little tweaks and stuff that you can do. And so we'll keep messing around with the enemy as time goes on and just keep tweaking its transitions. You guys can really make it feel good. So next we're gonna work on the ranged enemy. And I'm so excited again, I keep saying this to show you guys how easy it is going to be to create this next enemy, but it's really gonna be a fun time. Before I go, let's quickly fix the combat dummy like I said I would. So as you see, we cannot damage it. Hopefully you guys tried fixing it by yourselves, but it's easy enough. Let's go to our scripts folder, enemies, and then our combat dummy controller. And basically we just have to come to our damage function. And instead of taking in a float array, we're going to take in attack details, called details. And then we're gonna decrease the current health by details dot damage amount. And here just change it to details dot position dot X go back to unity and we run the game we should be able to damage the dummy again easy I think we should make the enemy charge a little bit longer nope enemy one charge state charge time let's make it one and a half seconds That's better. Awesome, okay. I think the enemy feels really good right now. And we have such a cool base to expand on now to create more complex enemy behaviors. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you're excited for the next episode, I am. And so before I go, I would just like to give a huge thank you to all my supporters and wonderful people on Patreon. And then also a huge special thank you to Lewis, Yupa and Gregory for your support on Patreon. You guys are absolute mad lads. And yeah, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.